you are listening to the Fire You Carry podcast. On today's episode, Kevin is joined by Trevor Williams. Trevor has an amazing story. He grew up in places like Africa and Haiti. He actually lived through the earthquake that Haiti had that killed 300,000 people. He is also a fireman here at Los Angeles County Fire, and he invented the Williams Key, which is a forcible entry tool. Make sure that you follow the links in the show notes. Give Trevor a follow on his YouTube, his Instagram page. If you are in the first responder or military community and you don't know what a Williams Key is, definitely make sure you go check him out. Look up his tools. They're really great, and it's something that Kevin and I have actually used on the job. So it's one of the few new tools that have come out that we've found useful. So check that out for sure. Thank you for listening. Enjoy. You didn't know if you're going to make it through the day, especially as I had a better understanding of mortality in, in Haiti. I was exposed more. I would see dead bodies in the streets. I had friends who were kidnapped. Bullets would hit our house at night. Riots in the streets, all this stuff where I was like, I don't care about the, like, you got my coffee order wrong. You know, I, I care about making it through today. And if I got to eat today, even better. You know, like, the things that concerned me were not the things that can concern, like, first world culture people. And I think it's very eye-opening, and I encourage everybody to get out there and, and travel and go to places and meet people less fortunate than yourselves, because it's really eye-opening. and. We really do live in a bubble in America. We're very fortunate. We live better than 99% of the rest of the world. We take it for granted. Trevor Williams, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be on. This is awesome. You were on um, with our dear friend Zuniga when he had a podcast. I think he's going to bring it back. But it was really cool. Right around that time, I want to say it was at least a year ago or so, we started seeing some of these Williams keys out there. And, you know, you, there's a lot of fire. If, I think if you're on, if you're a fireman and you're on any sort of social media, you're going to see like fireman products all over the place. But I didn't know it was one of our own. Until Zuniga told me, like, hey, this is Trevor Williams. He works down at Ace. He wakes his own thing. So I think this is really cool. I mean, maybe we can talk about, just to start off, the Williams Key. How did you get into this thing? And tell us what it's all about. Yeah. So, yeah, Zuniga was great. It was, it was awesome being on his podcast. I, I do hope he brings it back because everybody asked me about him. I had reposted our interview on YouTube, and that's the only thing people find now when they search for it. So I get, I get asked all the time, that guy was great. I, I miss him. I hope he brings it back. And I agree. So yeah, the Williams key, um, my background before I became a firefighter, uh, was in commercial construction, specifically doors. So installing doors and locks. And, uh, we did lots of schools, colleges, fire stations, police stations, worked at El Segundo for a little bit doing blast proof doors. Uh, needless to say, I got a lot of hands on with locks and, and how doors work. So that kind of got my feet wet with, uh, being creative with entry. When I got on the job, I saw guys busting down doors left and right. And that was fun. And I love irons and halogens and using them, but went only when it's necessary because we leave grandma with a $2,000 door repair. And sometimes we were in the wrong house even like we weren't even supposed to bust that door. Yes. Um, so yeah, I used uh, my knowledge and skills and started making some of my own tools and I had made what is now known as the Williams key a long time ago, years and years ago to, to help myself get into doors. And I started bringing it out on, on calls and it, it worked a lot, especially in my district uh, in West Hollywood, which has a lot of commercial and apartments. And every shift I was using it. So before long, guys wanted one. And it, it, it takes a while just to make one tool. So I got enough requests to make a small batch. So I made a small batch. Those went really quick. And uh, Are you just making this out of the house, out of the garage? Like, what are you doing? Uh, no. Well, now I have a factory in, in downtown L.A. and they pump them out for me. But um, wow. before, it was just like, yeah, cutting up pieces of metal and like a framing square. And I tell guys, make your own if you want, like a framing square, cut it up. 
but it does take a long time and it's not going to be as nice and to spec as a Williams key. So anyway, yeah, it took off the uh, word of mouth and um, now we're coming up on 15,000 tools sold. Um, wow. So, well, Williams keys sold and I got about 10 other products, but uh, that's the best seller. So yeah, it's been a whirlwind that's really ever cool. since. All right. So if you guys don't, if you're not in the fire world, you're not familiar with force entry. I mean, typically we do a lot of calls at night and uh, every door and a lot of gates are locked. And so we have to gain access to that. And what Trevor was talking about is usually we use a tool called a Halligan um, and a flathead ax and we will break into the house. But like he's saying, it does cause quite a bit of damage. And then don't even talk about using a rotary saw. We're going to cause uh, a lot of damage. But this key, and we'll, we'll put a link to it. There's t a lot of really cool videos on your Instagram and stuff like that of firemen doing it. It takes seconds, seconds to go into, like, I think one of the more useful ones, like we had one on our truck, is that the apartment house gate, like going into the gate. When you get a call at an apartment, and it can be a 500-unit apartment, you know, one of the things you don't want to delay getting in there or destroying this gate and so you can get his key and it takes literally seconds to get into these gates yeah and yeah and it's crazy um i get videos sent to me like photos and videos every at least every week sometimes every day people just love it and they they feel like johnny on the spot you know when they're, they're able to impress, impress their <laughs> crew and get in and sometimes it saves a life sometimes they're getting in and being able to render cpr in time or preventing a suicide or, or whatnot i i get messages from because we sell to like the government we SWAT uh, a lot of yeah wow. a lot of police and it's not just fire so I'm constantly getting uh, hit up by like SEAL teams and like really cool stuff that's amazing I think there's a lot of um, pretty sharp firemen that have backgrounds that are not in firefighting and obviously yours that's so specific on building and doing construction on doors I know, I've seen a lot of guys. I know a lot of guys. You talk around the table. They got great ideas, but they don't take it to the next level is starting to actually fabricate something and create something. And so tell me the, the jumping off point with that. I mean, you, you have a background in this. You see an idea, but what makes you decide, hey, there's something here that I should make? Um, yeah, so it, it is hard to take that first step. I was fortunate, and I'll, I'll put a little plug in here. Uh, there's another company I've been involved with uh, to get off the ground. It's called Medfire. And Medfire um, actually helps inventors to create tools. So it's like a wow. multifaceted company, but one of their branches is Medfire Innovations. And they've helped people with patents and designs and sometimes the funding to get them up and running. So I've been, uh, I think since, shoot, it's been almost 10 years, I want to say, working with, with that company. And um, you'll you'll start hearing about them soon, but that's kind of how I started. And because Williams Key did so well, now I'm able to experiment with new ideas very easily. Like if I come up with an idea now, I already have the platform and the, and the fan base and the people that know Williams Key works that trust other products that come out. So now I have a door hanger, when we break a door, or we, we make entry into a building that nobody was home, but we want to leave them a note. I, there's like a little door hanger thing that I made. And those, I think we've done like 20,000 of those. And those are doing well. Wow. Like little wedges and other, other sorts of things for getting into doors. So now it's easy. Now I come up with an idea and throw it on the website. And uh, if it sells, it sells. If not, oh, well. <laughs> That's really cool, though. So they, they help give the expertise in an area that you might not know is like how to patent and market it and that kind of a thing. And that's pretty cool because I think all the guys have all these awesome ideas, but they have no idea what the next step would be. Yeah. And people, and for your listeners, feel free to reach out to me um, through email or social medias or whatnot, but I'm always willing to like, listen to your idea. We can sign a non-disclosure if you want um, and kind of point you in the right direction for, for the next steps. You know, it's not always, it's not the same for everybody. So, um, I, but I'm, I, I love uh, innovation and I love, as firefighters, we're critical thinkers, right? We're always trying to solve problems and think outside the box. So a lot of the times um, 
and we like to make things better. So a lot of the times there's tons of people with ideas. Your idea as dumb as you might think it may be, could be the next you know great big thing and help a lot of people while you're at it. That's pretty cool. It's pretty funny when those, those kind of that way, we're always trying to be a little bit more efficient at work or see how we can do something a little bit better. And then if you try to do that at home in the home life, it doesn't work. Too good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, babe, we can do these dishes. If we just do this, like then she's like, whatever, don't do that. And I do it my way. Stop. <laughs> I'm trying to get the Roomba but, at home for forever, but you know, the wife likes the way she does it. So <laughs> yes, no, <laughs> that's so cool. When, um, tell me, I, this is kind of cool. So, I mean, you're, you're working doors, but I want to back up even further. Um, we had talked, uh, before you got on, I think you just have a, a really interesting background. Tell me about, you are a missionary and kind of your, your, your growing up story. Tell me a little bit about that. So I grew up as a missionary. I was, uh, first, first born, um, for about seven years. And, uh, my parents were, were all Christians and, um, decided to move to Africa with an organization called World Vision. And they do emergency relief work. They're one of the largest nonprofit organizations out there. So yeah, we, we moved to a country called Zaire. It's called Democratic Republic of Congo now. But we lived there during a big war and civil unrest. And a lot of people have seen the movie Hotel Rwanda. Zaire bordered Rwanda and we were there while all that was going on. So there was the uh, crazy Hutus and the Tutsis were warring and a lot of gunfire. People would bring us valuables because they didn't know if they were going to get robbed or killed. And they said, we'll come back and, you know, pick up my wedding ring if we, if we make it, you know, through the month or whatever their concern was. So yeah, we lived in Zaire and then it, eventually it got so dangerous that we had to evacuate to South Africa. We lived in Johannesburg in South Africa for about a year and tra tried to wait for things to cool off and it didn't really. So we ended up going back to Zaire, which had then changed its name, uh, as I mentioned before, Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's still that name today. And it just was too dangerous. So we ended up uh, coming back to the States, to Connecticut, and um, lived there for a little bit and eventually ended up moving to the island of Haiti. Haiti, uh, a lot of people have heard of wow. Dominican Republic. So Haiti is attached to that. And together they make up the island of Hispaniola. It's about 565 miles south of Florida. Well, now people, people have heard of Haiti because of the Haiti earthquake. Um, that kind of put Haiti on the map, almost took it off the map. But uh, yeah, so there's a, the Haiti earthquake and we were doing the same type of work. My family was still with World Vision. And at that point, my dad had become the director of World Vision for Haiti, for the Haiti uh, office. While I was there, I was in high school and same deal as Africa. It started to get pretty violent too. A bunch of civil unrest. They were throwing over, overthrowing the president. The president left the country. Lots of rioting and fires in the streets and gunfire every night. So yeah, they wanted us to get out of there. And that's how I ended, ended up in California. So I got to California when I was 15, decided I wanted to pursue firefighting, got involved with the Explorer program here in Azusa, wow. um, post 16 out of station 32. And I did the whole, whole, sh whole shebang with the Explorers, the Explorer Academy. I was class of 48 and then uh, did my ride alongs as long as I could until I aged out and was going through the hiring process during that time as well. This is crazy. So how old were you when you were in Zaire? What, when you guys moved over there? Four years old to eight years old. So I was just a wow young buck. <laughs> Are the, is it English speaking over there? Is there a school that you're going to? Like how did, what does your day to day look like as a kid in Africa? I went to an English speaking Christian school called Tessal and everybody there spoke English. Uh, Swahili and French were common. 
common languages spoke while I was there, but a lot of people spoke English, or at least as a kid, the people I was around, um, everybody seemed to speak English, but my parents knew French, so they were able to navigate all the, all the other stuff that I didn't know how to speak while we were there. That's wild. And Haitians speak French as well, right? Yeah, they speak uh, Creole and, and French and Spanish. Uh, Creole is the main language and it's, it's like French. There's a lot of French in it. And then, um, uh, yeah, Creole, Creole and French are the, the main languages there. It's funny. This is a long time ago, but I had a buddy from college that moved out to South Florida and we were at some restaurant or something. And there's a group of dudes that were sitting next to us. And I was like, Hey guys, what's going on? What's going on? And then I didn't realize that they, they weren't from South Florida. They're all Haitians and they responded in French. And I was like, Oh, they're not, these aren't, these aren't Florida boys. They're, they're Haitians, you know, but yeah. And, and then one of them spoke English, but it was, it was amazing to hear. That was the first exposure I've heard of Haiti. This is pre earthquake and seeing how devastated or impoverished that Island was. It sounded like it's uh, some rough times on that Island. Yeah. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western hemisphere. And that was before the earthquake. And, and wow. to touch on what you said, yeah. Um, Florida, Miami, and then New York are where you'll find a lot of Haitians. That's where the, the planes fly out of Haiti. So I think uh, they've established themselves in those two areas, mainly. That's mostly where I've heard the Creole um, from from people, people I don't know, but like passerbys and stuff. I'm like, oh, shoot, they're Haitian. They're speaking Creole. But did, did, did I mention that I was in the earthquake? No, let's talk about this. So you're, how old were you during the earthquake? So I'd already moved out of Haiti to California. I was living out in California on my own and my family had moved back to Haiti. So this was in 2010. I had just turned 19 and I went back to visit Haiti and visit my family. I hadn't been back in the country in five years and I just happened to go the week that the earthquake hit. So I got there a few days. Oh. I didn't plan it that way, but I, <laughs> I got there a few days before the earthquake and the goal was to work with the United Nations. They had just started a fire brigade. So they had a little bit of equipment, but like no training and stuff. So I was like, oh, cool. I, I have some fire training and I know Haiti and I know the language a little bit and it might be good for me to go and help out and go back to Haiti for a little bit and visit my family. So I went down there and my interview with the UN, cause you got to pass all their little it's just a temporary job, but you still have to go through the process and get the badge and make sure they like you and stuff. So my interview was supposed to be on the day of the earthquake during the time of the earthquake. And the day before I called them and I was like, Hey, Ed, I don't really want to waste my time here. Can I do the interview a day early so we can get to work? And they allowed me to come in and do the interview. Everything went good. I got the, got the blessing, but had, had I had, done my interview during our scheduled time, I probably would have died. Every, everybody Whoa. in that building died, uh, about 300, Whoa. About 300 people. So God was looking out for, for sure for me and my, my mom and my sisters, I have two sisters, younger sisters. They have an even more incredible story. They were on, they, they lived in a five story apartment on the bottom floor on the side of a mountain. So it kind of hung off the mountain and all five stories pancaked down and they were in that building while it was happening on the bottom floor. And, uh, so for about 24 hours, we didn't know if they were alive or not. And, and they did make it that they're, they're alive and well today, but there was a lot of unknown because my dad had gone back to look for them. I was at an orphanage. Like I wasn't able to get around for a while because I was at an orphanage orphanage down in the city, but my dad was close to the apartment. That's where his office was. And he went back to look for them and he had like realized nobody was alive in that building. And, um, he didn't know that they had already gotten out and, uh, were trying to like find shelter. So then he came and found me and, uh, 
he he had told me like your mom and sisters were at the apartment and there's nobody alive there so basically telling me that they hadn't made it but oh. like unconfirmed right so uh, a couple of specs about the earthquake 300,000 people died it's the greatest natural disaster in modern history and well, i think we're still getting numbers on turkey but i don't think there there as many as uh the haiti earthquake their infrastructure is just so poor and uh overpopulated that all the houses just came down concrete unreinforced uh concrete it was 7.0 and 39 seconds long so that's like we, we hear bigger earthquakes today um especially the turkey one was pretty major but um with a poor infrastructure and for that duration of time it really does a lot of damage and then after that hundreds of aftershocks that would bring down more and more buildings so to continue the story my dad picked me up and we went we drove up to the mountains where it was safer we stayed at our pastor's house that night it was hard to get around because all these walls had fallen into the street so it was like a slow like off-roading type of deal all the way up into the mountains and um couldn't sleep that night obviously i thought my mom and sisters were dead and aftershocks continued to hit I wanted to believe that like maybe one of them had made it or something, you know, I was like trying to be optimistic. I wanted all of them to obviously like to be alive, but I was reasoning with myself and like trying to wrap my head around it. It, it didn't seem real. It felt like I was in a dream or a movie or something. So early the next morning, I wanted to get right to work, go to the apartments, dig them out. And my dad was like, no, we got to eat. We need our strength. And uh, I was like, yeah, he, he's right, you know, you gotta eat. All right, cool, forced down some food. And during breakfast, he started talking about funeral plans for oh, my family. Really? And I was just like, I hadn't cried for them or, or anything yet because I wanted to believe that there was hope. But once he said that, I, I kind of lost it. I had to get up and I walked, um, I walked to the balcony of the house we were in and I hadn't seen Haiti in the daylight yet because the earthquake happened around uh it was like almost 5 p.m and then it got dark and we didn't know the magnitude of the earthquake at that point either so i walked out to the balcony first time seeing haiti in the daylight and now we're at a vantage point up in the mountains looking down into the city and then there's the ocean it's kind of that's the flow uh, mountains and then basin and then ocean you can see the whole thing from where we were and um, there were fires everywhere, like smoke headers, just the collapses caused a lot of fires. There's still like smoggy, like like dust in the air. And you could just hear wailing and people crying. And the sun was just, like just starting to come up. So it was like highlighting everything. And it's so vivid. This happened like 13 years ago and it's so vivid in my mind still to this day. And that's when I started to cry. Uh, just seeing all that and kind of taking in and, and realizing like this is really really bad and who knows how many people were affected by it so not soon after that we started driving down the mountain and there's people with suitcases going up the mountain people with suitcases going down the mountain um, a lot of people had scrapes and blood on their shirts and stuff people didn't really know what to do or where to go but we had all been through the same earthquake together and I started making eye contact with people. And even though there's a cultural difference and a language difference, we were all brothers and sisters at that point. Like everybody was family just trying to survive. The pastor was driving us down the mountain. My dad was in the front seat with him. I was sitting in the back and they took turns praying on the way down and um, just trying to prepare our hearts and minds for what we were about to see and um, hoping that the family was okay, you know. So we got to my dad's office to get shovels and body bags and, you know, supplies and stuff. And um, my, uh, as we were coming in the front gate, my mom and sisters came in the back gate. They walked in the back gate. Wow. And um, they're covered in debris. My, my, older sister like i'm older than her but she's the oldest of the two sisters she was helping my mom limp in and, and walk and i didn't see my youngest sister who was four years old at the time and 
I was grateful for my mom and my other sister, but I was like, oh no, like, did she not make it? When somebody was carrying her and um, she couldn't see, she got a bunch of debris in her eyes, but she was alive and everybody was alive. And we all just held each other and cried. And it was a beautiful thing, you know, going from uh, thinking that you lost the major part of your family and your life to getting it back again and getting a second chance. Uh, unbelievable. I, I mean, first of all, I mean, your parents sound like amazing people, but I put myself, you're a dad, I'm a dad now, like in your dad's shoes and you have a young man as your son, the oldest, but you're trying to hold it together thinking that your wife and daughters had just passed away. I don't have any idea. And yet he knows, you know, he's aware enough to know that you guys have to help and you're going to get some food and supplies and then go down into absolute chaos and try to help knowing that you have no idea what's going on with your wife. That sounds, you know, we think we're heroic and we do all these things, but that to me is like the most amazing thing that you can possibly think of is to try to pull it together and still help other people. And then I can't imagine what that reunion was like when, you know, you see your mom and your sisters, I mean, come in the back door that has to affect you. Yeah. It's something I think about every day, you know, to this, yeah, to this day, like when I, when I pray and stuff, I, I thank God for sparing me and my family from the earthquake, you know, and we all got a second chance. You bring up a good point that I haven't thought about quite as much until recently. I'm a, I'm a new father. I have a 10 month old daughter and another one on the way. Yeah, congratulations. And thank you. Um, but yeah, the, the father's perspective and, and now looking back at my dad and everything that he was dealing with, I, I have a lot, of, a lot of respect for that man, and I don't know how he did it. On top of, so here's the other thing. He had like a high responsibility position as the director of World Vision in Haiti. He was the first point of contact from the U.S. Uh, CNN, Wolf Blitzer called in, and they had my dad on the line within probably a minute or two of the earthquake happening. And, of course, nobody knew any of the, the details yet other than, earthquake happened and it's really bad, you know, but yeah, he was dealing like all this political stuff too. And, and us, right. So, um, his priority was his family, but, um, yeah, I can't imagine all the, all the stuff he was, he was juggling during that time. Um, it's pretty incredible. I, w I want to go back since you were in Africa, since you're four, and then you're, you're kind of getting into your, you know, your, your young man stage in Haiti and, I, I can imagine that you don't know any different going to Africa at four, but did you know that your life was different than, let's say, an, a normal American kid living up in a suburb? Were you conscious of that at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, even coming out of Africa, we would visit the States. When you don't live in America, you call America the States. And um, we'd visit the States, and Burger King was, like, my favorite. Getting a slushy, like... <laughs> <laughs> These are like the greatest joys of my life when I was a little kid driving fast in a car because the roads were paved. Yeah, I, I definitely knew that my upbringing was different because every time we visited any of our, our friends and family in the States or go to church, like they'd just have a million questions. Yeah, as I, as I got older, I realized I was different, maybe more mature in some areas, <laughs> not, not in some other areas, but just the life experience that I had been through at a young age, you know, as, as like a six year old and a seven year old in Africa. And then as a young teenager in Haiti, some days, you know, you, you didn't know if you're going to make it through the day, especially as I had a better understanding of, um, mortality in, in Haiti. I was exposed more, I would see dead bodies in the streets. I had friends who were kidnapped. I would hear bullets would hit our house at night. There were, yeah, riots in the streets, all this stuff where I was like, I don't care about the, like, you got my coffee order wrong. You know, I, I care about making it through today. And, <clears throat> right. and if I got to eat today, even better. You know, like the things that concerned me were not the things that can concern like first world culture people. And I think it's very eye-opening and I encourage everybody to 
get out there and and travel and go to places and meet people less fortunate than yourselves because it's really eye opening and we really do live in a bubble in in the in America. We're very fortunate. We live better than 99% of the rest of the world, in my opinion, and uh, we take it for granted. That's so true. I mean, we used to do a lot of surfing trips down in, in Mexico. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very weird, bizarre feeling to go from like extreme wealth of San Diego, literally like one of the most desirable places in the world to be in. And then you cross the border and it's extreme poverty and you see a six year old selling gum, you know what I mean? And that you're saying, what are we complaining about? What do we have to worry about? We have so much excess and it's, and it's kind of a wild feeling that that's less than 20 minutes apart, you know? And I, I can only imagine that's got to be amplified by spending a lifetime of growing up in there where you're saying like, yeah, normal kid doesn't, it's complaining that there's ketchup on his, you know, happy meal. And yet you're like, this is the greatest whopper. I can't wait to have more of these. <laughs> you know, was there pushback at all from you? Like as a young kid saying, Hey dad, what are we doing out here? Like, I, I kind of want to just go to soccer practice and have a whopper. Was there pushback at all? I, I think the hardest struggle in my young life was moving to Haiti because I had, I was beginning to appreciate the good life in Connecticut. And um, I had my, mm. my group of friends. I liked going to the movies. I was just enjoying being, uh, you know, like a preteen and everything that comes with that. And then going from, so where we lived in Connecticut is, is a pretty nice area. Um, it's right up there next to New York. And a lot of people that work in New York live in Connecticut and there's like big properties and nice houses and I was enjoying it. And I had never, it was culture shock going from Africa to this. So leaving all that behind, um, it, your friends are really important when you're young, right? Like For sure. really involved with your youth group and just, I think um, that time and maybe like into high school too, like you value your friends the most and that's like what your world evolves around. And now as adults, we would like have less friends because we have families and kids and stuff. Um, but yeah, during that time, leaving that to go to Haiti, where it's like, all right, we're going to another Africa, like another type of like dangerous country where I don't know the culture. I don't know the language. I need to be careful and like it's dangerous and all this stuff. Um, it was really hard for me that first year moving to, Af oh, sorry, moving to Haiti. Um, I just, I, I don't think I knew what depression was, but I, I felt like now looking back, I'm like, I was probably a little bit depressed about the whole situation. And then eventually I got established in Haiti and got my friends and figured it out, figured out the, how Trevor was going to manage. And it really changed me a lot, I think, because I was in survival mode over there. As I mentioned before, like some, some days are like really, really tough days. Like you don't know <laughs> if you're going to make it through the day or not. Um, so I, I think that's, that's when I lost like a, a fear for death. Like I had to embrace that, that, that was an option kind of like I, I, I never went to war or was in the military, but I would imagine that's the same type of approach that people who are in combat have to embrace. It's like, yeah, I might die doing this, but I can't let that stop me because, you know, when, when, when you're going through hell, you got to keep moving. You don't want to, you don't want to stop in it. Um, so yeah, it, it's sink or swim. So in, in order to survive, you got to let go of some of those fears and just keep moving forward. And I had to learn that as a young, young teenager. That's an, yeah, that'll grow you up fast. And I can imagine, did you have pressure of responsibility for your younger siblings since they were much younger than you? For your sisters, did you have to be that that older brother kind of watching out? You guys kind of stick out with your complexion, and you're from the states, you know. I mean, I'm sure that you had to have that on top of everything. Yeah, I'm seven years older than my next sibling sister, and then she's seven years older than our youngest sister, so we're all seven years apart. Um, so I'm 14 years older than my youngest sister, so I was out of the house. Well. My family left me here in, in California uh, when I was 18. 
So I was out of the house soon, but I, uh, that being said, I didn't get to spend that many years with my youngest sister, but my other sister, yeah, I definitely looked out for her. And, um, we all, yeah, we all we were a close family because of that. Everywhere we went, we were all we had, you know, so we had to confide in each other and look out for each other. And I think it's a unique family dynamic that we have that a lot of people, uh, don't get to have. Yeah. I can't imagine. I mean, you, you had to grow up fast in that world, which is, I'm sure has its positives and its negatives. Um, but you could probably, I, I can imagine now you, we, we live in LA. It's one of the most we work in LA, one of the most excess driven cities in the world, right? And that, do you have, is there a chuckle from time to time that you have a different perspective or there's a gratitude for what we do have now? It's gotta be pretty wild thinking about your history. Yeah. <laughs> So at the firehouse, if we bring the firehouse in, in this for a sec, one example, and it, it gets me every time, is our excess of food. Yes. You know, how we cook, and we're, we're all big eaters, right? So at eights, there's 13 guys there, 13 firefighters, and we cook for like 30 people every meal. And so we always have an excess of food, and nobody takes it home because that makes it weird, like if, you know that's just you're not, just not allowed to do that like taking taking food home has never been okay so we throw it away and um it like i i remember um watching three kids with one spoon scraping like there was no rice left in this bowl but scraping like the leftover goo that you know the the residual rice and like they had half a spoon that these three kids were sharing, you know, just starving, starving kids. And we have such excess here that we're, we're throwing it away. You know, that like this stuff could save villages if we could transport it over somewhere, we, but we can't. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the things that kind of sticks out to me real quick. And the other thing is like the stress of the job. I've been able to manage stress really well. Eh, not so much lately, but <laughs> up until this point, my life. <laughs> My life's moving at a million miles an hour right now with all the kids and the business and everything. Yes. But before that, um, the the stuff we see on the job, the violence and just the sad stories that we we become a part of, that never fazed me because my worst days were different um, growing up. So I, I've been able to like have a healthy balance, I think, as a fireman. Where oh yeah, it's it's just another day at the office where some people and and nothing wrong with it, but, uh, have a harder time processing the things we see on the job. Yeah, that's a great point. I, we've definitely talked to people that had, uh, maybe challenging upbringings and yours, you know, if you're in survival mode all day and you're just scraping for food, then, you know, getting up a few times a night, is not the biggest deal in the world. And like you said, if you've seen dead bodies and you're worried about your own safety and your sister's safety, then, I mean, yeah, I can imagine that it's not, it's all, it's all perspective. It's like, Hey, I've been here, done that. I've been surviving since I was a kid Then no big, you know, no big deals. You know what I mean? But I, I do think, I mean, those things all probably catch up to us at some point, but I think yeah, it's an amazing, you know, people that have had tougher backgrounds seem to be tougher and it's, it builds that resiliency and that's huge, right? Because I mean, resiliency is everything. We're going to have challenges in your life. You're going to go through things. And it's, uh, it's I think it's a, a culmination of your experiences and how you're going to deal with those. Yeah, I think one of the things that has been therapeutic for me is I do like right now a podcast, right? So I get to do these yeah. about once a month or so. Um, I started a nonprofit after the Haiti earthquake building houses for earthquake survivors. And I got to go around at all sorts of colleges and churches and share my story. Um, wow. Is that the fear may foundation? Uh, yeah. Fear, it, it looks like fear may it's firm. So it's, uh, firm. Yeah, it's the Creole spelling for strong. F I R M. U. Oh, right. not the Spanish. I was thinking Spanish. Yeah, not the Spanish. Fear yeah. May. Although that's, um, that's kind of a, I wanted to make a t-shirt about that. The, so the firm, found, how old are you when you found this? 19. Yeah. Wow. You're 19 years old. You think about starting and did you, how did you get uh, into construction and say that you had the aptitude to help people build houses after earthquake disaster? The, so the construction came naturally because of my 
my prior like job as a construction worker um, before getting into fire. And oh, and I wasn't a firefighter yet at that time. So I was like actively a construction worker. Nice. And I started at 18 just doing like general contracting and like demolition and stuff, just swinging a hammer and doing whatever grunt work I could. And, um, and eventually got on with a, a door contracting company, which is finished finish carpentry. But I had a good understanding of like how construction worked and the houses that we built in Haiti were mostly prefab. So we didn't waste too much time. Once we got on the ground, we had the, the trusses put together already and uh, some of the walls and we'd drive them out in these big Mack trucks um, to our, our job sites. And the prerequisite was these um, families were vetted through the elders in the community as to who needed um, the houses the most. So it was usually like single mothers with like seven kids who the father died in the earthquake or something like that. And then they needed to have land for us to build on. In Haiti, you can kind of like claim land. It's all the land is the government's, but if you like put up a fence and stuff and nobody else has claimed it, you can build there. And then uh, they would level the land before we got there. And then once my teams hit the ground, we'd hire Haitian construction workers to create jobs and stimulate the economy. And then I would oversee it. And then whoever wanted to come down and be part of the, the project, um, like American wise, they, they usually had to bring something to the table, whether it was like, Oh, uh, you're, you're a photographer, a videographer, you have construction background or you made a large donation and you just wanted to go. So yeah, we, we would keep the team small because it, it is a dangerous country and I would hire um, like armed guard to go with us and drivers and translators. And I told everybody like, Hey, if I say we got to go, we got to go. Cause um, I'm seeing stuff you guys aren't and I know the culture in the country and things are not always what they seem, but because we were helping, more than once the uh the people and the villagers and stuff they protected us for the fact that we were doing good work and we were there to like help them out and and whatnot so um that's amazing how long did it take to build a house from a prefab house like from start to finish we've we've done uh two in a day before we built 30 whoa we built 39 houses uh total so far but we've so most of it can be built in a, in a day. And then there's so lightweight. Um, it's like tin roof. It's not like our houses here in America. Um, right. It's like a, a single room. It can be partitioned into two rooms. There's a loft, there's a porch, there's like windows for cross breezes and stuff, but there's no plumbing. There's no electricity. Like those aren't luxuries that uh, a lot of people in Haiti have anyway. So these houses are so lightweight though, that we pour the foundation after we build the house. So we, we pour concrete like inside of it after we've gotten the structure up. And that seems to work pretty well with um, the, the scenario that we have going on there. And we just want them to be hurricane proof. So we put like weather straps and we anchor these houses down. Haiti gets a lot of hurricanes and rain. But um, if it were to fall on you, you would not die. Like they're, they're, they're lightweight enough to where there's no fear of death if it were to fail and they're not going to fail they're, they're built really well but yeah that's the process and so each trip we'll try and put up a couple houses and yeah it's very very rewarding um work and i can only imagine is there any jealousy of some people in the community when you're throwing up one of these houses for a family and they're like how come we're not you know getting that thing i'm sure that's got to be a thing too right yeah one one story that comes to mind, this this guy offered his land to like some lady and her kids. And he's like, Yeah, you can you can build on my land, you can have your house there. And we built the house. Come to find out, he goes and puts a lock on it and he's like, You can't live there unless you like do favors for me and, and you know <laughs> stuff so we're like yeah, smoke yeah we're like, got like smoke. all right that's not gonna fly so we actually like deconstructed that house and moved it and built it for her somewhere else wow all right so i want to go i want to pivot this that's incredible work and, and 
man, one day I'd love to get down there with you and swing a hammer if I could. But you are now a young teenager. This is pre-earthquake, and you're doing uh, fire explorer stuff. How did you get even in the realm of knowing about firefighting and say, that's what I kind of eventually want to do? When I got to California, I was in the 10th grade. I think I was 15. And everybody was asking me, oh, what, what are you going to do? And uh, a lot of people brought up firefighting to me. They're like, yeah, it's like you, you're helping people as a missionary. So you get to help people as a firefighter. And I've always been like very physical and active and into fitness and couldn't see myself you know, in front of a desk for my whole career. And so I was like, yeah, that, that sounds pretty good. So I went, I live in Azusa now and I was living in Azusa then. And I went to the local fire station, which is fire station 32. LA County. They have the slide, right? Yeah, the slide. Yeah. I think they're the yeah. only one with the slide. And, um, yeah. So for those that don't know, they have a dorm upstairs. It's a two story, but instead of a fire pole, they have a slide. I think I've worked a few days there and definitely taking the slide. The thing comes down hot. You go pretty fast on that thing. They, they had to put like cushions and stuff at the end because guys were flying off it so fast. And then the big mistake is waxing it. You never want to wax that slide. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I did it one time in the middle of the night, and I said, no, nah, I'm taking the stairs next time. I think it was too fast. Yep. We have a pole at eight. It's a three-story pole, and um, I was on probation there seven years ago, and I would take the pole for every call. And now I'm like, everything hurts, and I'm like, ah, <laughs> fires only. <laughs> I know the struggle. Yeah, yeah, I know the struggle. So you, you go to 32s. You literally – we just talked to Justin Countess, who was really funny, his dad – had him at, I think, 14 or 15 years old, go by himself at, at nighttime and ring the doorbell in Lancaster and ask the guys, what do I need to do? And it, it's it's a very cool thing. I think that, you know, you think of a normal 15-year-old that's playing video games. It doesn't seem like they have a lot of, like, that self-starter attitude to, like, go down to the fire station and talk to grown men and say, what do I need to do? Yeah, so I went to 32s and did the same thing. Um, they have their own Explore program. Luckily, like, I picked the right firehouse to talk to. Yeah. And it, it was a big post. Uh, it's a pretty big station and they used to not be with County. So they have their own tower and everything. And um, it's like not an active tower, but there's, there's a lot of space there. So a lot of space to train. And I had a, uh, had long hair and like bracelets and all this stuff. Like I did not look like your typical explorer. So I decided pretty soon to join and then had to, they shaved my head. And I think, uh, let's see, Captain Salmo, and he's a captain there now. When I met him, he wasn't a captain, but he was one of our advisors. And he played a huge role in my life. Um, very mo motivating guy. And he saw this guy from Africa, pretty much, or Haiti, sorry, um, <laughs> yes. like with no clue what goes on in America, like very out of touch with the culture and some, just some Tarzan from another country showed up to his station pretty much. <laughs> so he took me under his wing and uh, really helped me get through um, what it means to be a firefighter. He showed me and um, we did all the training. He got me ready. Our, our vetting process for the Explorer Academy was pretty intense because they could only take like three guys per post. Our post was big. We had like 40 or 50 guys. So you really had to be like cream of the crap out of the post in order to be eligible to be sent to the Explorer Academy. So we all took it very seriously. And I think the majority of our certified explorers, which are the guys who go and pass the Explorer Academy, you get certified and then you're able to do ride alongs. Majority of our guys like are on the job now. Um, so it's, yeah. it's all the guys who took it real serious. That's a really cool thing. I, Justin was, Kellness was just saying the same thing. I had all the guys, it was very similar, but up in Lancaster, that all the guys that were certified and did the thing, they're all on the job. And that's that's a pretty amazing thing to take 16-year-olds. And it is a very competitive industry to get into, um, to take them at that age, to get them hired on. That's That's pretty incredible. So I know... You did that, and then you went to Haiti, and then were you testing? Like at some point, you get out of Haiti, probably the wild, I mean, the most life transformation thing that anybody could possibly go to. 
do you still have your eye on the prize with the fire thing? Did you come back and start testing or what, how did that get going? Put in my application with County before I turned 18, I was like, I want to, I want to make this happen. It's probably a good thing. I didn't get hired at 18. It took me <laughs> seven or eight years, but I, I traveled all around the U S I applied to 60 different departments. Wow. I took New York's test, a bunch in Texas, some in Washington. I was motivated, but it's just very, very competitive and, and tough. I think the earthquake, I think I missed a part of county's process while I was there because I ended up staying a couple of weeks after the earthquake to help out and stuff. And um, I think I ended up like appealing. It might have been the, the interview or, or something where they, they pushed me back a year. They still let me do it, but I was like, hey, I was in the Haiti earthquake, like I got stuck down there. And yeah, so that slowed slowed down the process for me a little bit, but all for a reason. You know, I was grateful for the skills I learned in the meantime as a construction worker. And I treated every, every day like I was a fireman. I'd throw my ladder the same way we'd throw it at Explorers and at the fire station. I'd lay out my construction or my, um, what's it called? Extension cords, the way I lay out a hose. And like, my mind was like, I'm a firefighter. I'm just right now You're I'm it. working as a construction worker, but no, I'm a firefighter in my head. So I treated it that way. Oh, it's very cool. and um, I was a volunteer firefighter for the city of Sierra Madre. Uh, I did that for okay. four years in the meantime. And you know, you're on probation for a year, no matter where you go. But I knew there that wasn't like where I was going to end up. So my four years there in my head, I was always on probation. Like I, I'm never like going to sit and watch a movie or like, I didn't want to get comfortable as a firefighter before finishing probation for LA County or whatever other career department decided to pick me up. That's pretty cool. I, it's a very defeating process. You test all over the world and you keep getting no, or you get really close. Like I remember getting to a chief's oral interview and then I got, they took two guys and I was number three and my wife was saying, okay, so you got that far. Are you, that's did you start there at the next fire department? <laughs> no, we start yeah, over. So it's, I mean, and did, and to grind through seven or eight years with that mindset, I think you have to do, I know for anybody looking to get on, I think you have to have that mindset that you will become a fireman, but it's just, or a firefighter, it's just going to take time and you gotta, you gotta grind, man. You gotta get after it. Ever, uh, what, what do they say? You never fail until you quit. And um, yes. just got to keep your nose clean and keep at it. If, if you're one of those guys out there, guys or girls trying to get on, just keep at it. it it'll happen eventually. So I want to talk about, I think this is very cool that you had this incredible background. You get the dream job. How did you meet your wife? Is it Yasmina? Yasmina. Is your wife yeah, nice. It, it's an unusual name. I, so a lot of people get it wrong. They call her Jaz Jasmine or... Jasmina, but yeah, it's Yasmina. <laughs> I call her Mina for short. Um, we were actually uh, homeschooled together. We took a class. Uh, I think it was a music class. And we ended up, uh, yeah, meeting in high school. I think, yeah, I was like 17 or so. She was a few years younger, but in homeschool, that's okay. Like you, you take all sorts of random classes and your age doesn't matter, at least for some of them. So I was dating somebody else at the time. She was dating somebody else at the time. We never like got together until uh, I think like after college for both of us. So, but you kept in touch, kind of a thing. Or we, we kept in touch. Uh, my girlfriend didn't like her that much, so we we, we couldn't keep in that much. <laughs> of course touch. not. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we you know we remained that that option remained open as far as friendship went and then yeah i actually got in a bad motorcycle accident before getting hired and she would come around and like bring me food and stuff so she saw her like window of opportunity to at least get to know me better and um yeah that, that motorcycle accident probably saved my life i was i was living a fast life at that point and, um she my wife slowed me down and so did the injury and stuff so yeah that's we started dating pretty soon after that and uh we got married in 2018 that's awesome 
And now you have, is it Kylie? Is your, your baby girl? Kylie's a baby girl. She's uh, she's amazing. We're very blessed to have a very easy baby. She tricked us into having another baby. Uh, we have another girl coming in June. And yes. yeah, a girl dad over here. So any pointers? Same. I got two girls <laughs> myself. Mine are, mine are eight and 10. And Man, you know, I always always think, you know, we're firemen. You want to, I want to have boys and all this stuff. The, the greatest thing that's ever happened to me is having two girls. They melt me every day, and it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And I love being a girl dad. So, awesome. and and hey, they're they're gonna be around. My, mine are sixteen months apart, so yours are they like their best friends and enemies at the same time. But it's pretty cool having them close like that. So I'm, I'm sure you're in that, it. Yeah, that's good insight because they'll be fourteen months apart, so pretty much the same as you. And um, yeah, I'm interested. Is like that's a good thing, a bad thing? Are they they'll be friends? I think it's good. I would just my suggestion is to get two of every. They're at the age now. I can't get one a toy without getting the other one a toy. They're so close that they dig the same stuff, and so you can't. You have to get them like it, it's just like if you get one something, you got to get the other one something too. It's not like twins, but they're kind of like it. You know what I mean? They're so close. It's fun. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> no, I. He, he, I got to imagine being now you're your own father. You got the job. Your wife sounds amazing, but does this change you? Because you're a, you're a world traveler. You've had experiences that nobody else has had. You're starting business. It sounds like you're definitely one of those guys that doesn't sit still. Does that ground you at all? Does it have a, a difference feeling now that, Hey, I, maybe I got to get off a motorcycle or maybe, or does it, it's just, Hey, it's the same. So with kids. Yeah. Um, Having having this daughter totally changed my life, um, and it, it's a beautiful thing. Like I, everybody says, like I, I heard for years, like oh yeah, kids change you, and like you'll experience a love you never experienced before. And I heard that, and it's true. Like like can't even explain it. Um, me and my wife. So now I have a Harley, and um, one of the things me and my my wife like to do is these long road trips. We did uh, an eight thousand mile. Harley road trip in 2020. We saw like almost all the states. That was while the plane, planes yeah. weren't flying, everything shut down and stuff. So we're like, oh, we're going to travel. Yes. We take the Harley out. So we like doing long trips like that. And now, since having a kid, I think more about like, whoa, I don't want to hurt us or, or worse, you know, on the <laughs> motorcycle. Uh, uh, I still have it and I still like going out on it. But now I'm like, I don't yeah. know if I could like, wife on it too you know that's like the risk increases <laughs> yeah it's pretty funny like i used to do a lot of skydiving we travel a lot i haven't been once since my wife's like no you're not going skydiving anymore so i'm like what I, I, come on but i know a, a harley is different but i know you and i have seen some things on dirt bikes motorcycles harleys and you're like yeah uh now i question now because you know, we're the consistency of a watermelon by the time we show up there on a bike. So I'm sure it's different. Yeah. I, I think there's something wrong with me because I've been on tons of motorcycle accidents, like on the job, I've seen some very gruesome stuff and it never discourages me. Um, from getting back <laughs> on my bike. Yeah, I've been in, it's... I've been in three motorcycle accidents and I'm just, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> dumb when it comes to that sort of thing. But what has discouraged me is, is my daughter. So <laughs> Yes, that changes everything. Yeah, yeah, and two is a uh, man. I just I think you're it's pretty awesome. D does that make it more challenging? Do you have a hard time? You know, we've talked about this work life balance thing, which I don't think is even possible to have like a fifty fifty thing. You know, I, I like this one guy. He's talking about that you have seasons of life, where there's seasons of work, there's there's seasons of home life, there's seasons. And I don't know how, or maybe if you can speak on how you manage. Hey, work, recalls, family life, spending time with your daughter, a budding business, running up the firm foundation, building houses in Haiti. How do you, how do you manage? Don't, don't, I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, I think lately has been the like worst it's ever been as far as like time management or well, not time management, but like I manage the time, but there's just not enough of it. And that's increased since a, a kid, especially like that just threw such a big dynamic into our lives where now my wife can't help me do the Williams key stuff anymore or before she could. 
So now it's like double the work that I used to be doing and she's not going and like bringing home a paycheck. So it's double the, the money that I need to be bringing in to like support our, our lifestyle. And, um, yeah, there's just, I think for, for the first time I've like had trouble sleeping where I'm like, there's so much going on in my brain. And as exhausted as we get with all the stuff we do, running calls and everything, I'll like, I'll wake up randomly at like 3 a.m. and not be able to go back to sleep because I'm thinking about all the stuff I got to do that day. But yeah, I, I'm open to, to the advice, man. Like I, I'm trying to <laughs> no, find I was a balance you right me. now. I think that's what everybody. Yeah, I mean. For. I was definitely a yes, man. I like saying yes to somebody would say, Hey, do you want to go on this trip? Yes. Do you and your wife want to go to this? Yes. And I want to, and I find myself now saying no a lot more and not, uh, it's because I just have to do the things that are most important. Like most important right now is playing, you know, chess with my daughter and that's, you know, she likes chess and let's do that. And so I think that's a hard thing is that we, I think we're still go getters and want to do different things. We run, a nonprofit as well. And we get, but I find myself having to um, really schedule things like this during the day when they're at school. And uh, you know, it's hard when the kids are little, you don't get that time back. And so I, I really struggled with another overtime or another thing when they were like to five, six years old, cause they're at home all the time. And that I think one of the beauty of the fire schedule is making, if you could take a Tuesday, Wednesday off, we have a day off in the middle of the week that we could go to the beach or we could go to the park or do those things. And I think that's the only thing you have to do is you have to, that, that, that five, six year window when they're little, little and not at school, take as much advantage of that as you can. Yeah. I, I used to work a lot of days in a row and I do five days. The, The way I looked at it is I never had the opportunity to work overtime, like before getting, becoming a fireman. Now it's as much as you want which is like blows my mind. I'm like, that's like as much money as I want. Right. So I'm just going to make as much overtime and the more money I can make, the bigger I can grow my businesses and all the other things I love to do, but I'm not home. Um, and now since having a kid, it's hard for me to go to work for like one day without like, I'm like looking at pictures yes. and videos of, yes. and obviously my wife too, like I miss her, but yeah, with a kid who needs you and you know, you want to be there for them. Um, that that changes a lot. So I guess the the change that I've made since having a kid and the the work balance is I've worked very little, as little as possible. I did the FMLA and the, I already took my AB this year. Um, we just got back from Co- Costa Rica a couple yes. couple weeks ago. So um, we still try. To, we, we always loved traveling, and um, we did like Dubai and Maldives as the baby moon um before kylie kylie wow. came along and now costa rica was her first like non-us trip and she did great she'd been on eight airplanes already but i've tried to work the county job less um as much as i love it and I really do like I, I would do it for free if i could the uh the williams key stuff has been able to subsidize like the income and everything so i'm able to stay at home a little bit more and obviously like I, I help the guys out when they need it i'll work for whenever somebody asks me if i can like cover a day or, or work for them i will as, as much as i can but i haven't like sought out extra overtimes at work um for the reason that i want to be home with my wife and kid and i have a lot of responsibilities at home now too um more so than pre williams key yeah, there was one, there was one captain, uh, this is a while ago, this is like eight or nine years ago, he, his son came in and it, this hit me super hard when his son came in and he was kind of explorer age and he did a ride out and, uh, uh, you know, we were talking, Hey buddy, what are you looking to do? Are you looking to get into this thing? And he just looked over and said, no, he's like, my dad's gone all the time. And, uh, he's gone majority of the month. And so I'd rather, if I have my own family, I don't, I don't want that. And that hit me hard. And so I know guys that, you know, they set up certain lifestyles where, Hey, you're going to have to work and work overtime. But that hit me hard to say as a kid, that's his perspective, you know, that I don't want my kids to do that. So 
man, I, I have to, I have to be cognizant of that to say, Hey, there are times that we have to work or go on a brush fire or, but am I signing up for it because I want a truck or do, am I doing it because I need to, you know, so it, there's that the constant battle and I have not figured it out yet of, you know, of what the balance point is of being comfortable or being present at home. But if you figured it out, let me know, please. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do with my wife. Uh, and like you mentioned earlier or, or your friend did, uh, seasons, right? We, we have these seasons where it's like, it's a roller coaster of, Oh yeah, we work really hard. We're at we're at work uh, a bunch of days in a row. Okay, now we're going on vacation. We're gonna chill. And then, you know, it's not it's not always the same. Like, and for me, we'll get an order of like two thousand Williams keys, and so we're like, okay, shoot, like this is a hard season, home or like not at work. We're we're working to like prepare a bunch of orders. And but but I tell her like, yeah, it's just a season. Like after this, like we'll go do something nice or whatever. And but it's unpredictable too. Yeah. No, and I do think that is the gift though. If I can, what I find is, is that if I, if I can manage to put away the phone and I think the best gift of the fire department is that we don't have to check on emails, phone calls, things like you could be a hundred percent present when you are off if you want to be. And so I think I, I definitely try to make that an issue now that they're at school from, you know, let's say eight to three, that at three o'clock, I try to throw everything into a bag or a drawer and just be there. And that's, and I think that's, it's maximized time, you know, where you're not busy doing other things. I think that's pretty solid, but yeah, that's, that's pretty cool to hear that. I mean, we're all figuring it out as we go, but there's some gifts of this thing too, that you can absolutely be present or home for three days with the kids and, and do nothing if you want to, you know, and just be there with them sitting on the floor playing blocks. Yeah. Yeah, I'm waiting for this next season with uh, another kid coming. I, I don't know what that's going to look like either. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It's crazy, but awesome. I mean, I had our second in medic school, and that was disastrous uh, to the point of I wanted to quit medic school like three times and tried to quit, but I they wouldn't let me. But um, but it, def it definitely changes everything. I, I think I wanted to chase super busy places and do all the right things, and then the second kid comes, and I'm like, it's good to be home. It's good to be healthy. And so it's, it's definitely changed me for sure. All right. So what does the future look like? I mean, you got a lot of stuff going on, but um, you got some really cool products with the Williams key and stuff like that. And what, is, what do you think, where does that go? Where do you think, what's the goal with that? Well, Williams key um, is, is me, right? So like, I'm kind of the face of it. My name's in it. I know some people build up companies and then they sell them for a bunch of money and, and stuff like that. I don't think I'd want to do that. I do have a, a price, but it's like, it's like $10 million or something like that. You know, it's like <laughs> retire on yes, an island. Perfect. Like it, yeah. If you, if you came up with that much, I would consider it, but I just love doing it. Like last night I was on the red carpet with the Williams key cause it came out in a movie and, um, it, oh, right. Yeah, it was like a murder yeah. weapon in a movie. So I was like taking in a suit, like red carpet, taking photos with it. Um, we we're at the premiere last night in Hollywood. So it's just like the opportunities that come with it and the people I get to meet and the stories. And it's just so rewarding. Somebody sent me a book the other day. It's like a end of times Armageddon book. And my he's like, I wrote about your tool in my book and stuff. And he signed it send it to me. So I just love it. And I, uh, I'm a creative type of guy. So with running a business comes a lot of, a lot of stuff, right? Like your marketing and everything and figuring out how to like remain relevant. And I reach, I have like 13 different distributors now, uh, the fire store sells the Williams key and a bunch of my products and chief Miller and coastal fire training. Like there's just, everybody wants to sell my products. Um, Croker hit me up this morning uh they're like a i think chief croker was like fdny's first chief and then started a company it's been around forever it's like really big on the east coast so they're interested in selling my products and there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that goes on it's not just making a tool right it's like customer service it's relations it's making business deals and sales and i'm learning from it too like i never went to school for this stuff or anything but uh yeah, the future, I'm going to keep probably making tools. I've got two more products and the pipes coming out. 
hopefully soon. Um, we just came out with the triple XL Magnum HD folding version, which is a 35 inch Williams key that folds. Um, so that's the newest product on the page, but yeah, that's the, the future is unknown, but it's, it's moving quick more and more like people recognize me like in public now and That's TikTok cool. has like I've got probably like four or five videos with like three million views each and it's just it's becoming a known brand so that that's really cool for me there's a guy on my shift who makes shields county he does like the old school like emergency shields his name is Harry Hill yes and he's I asked him I was like, hey, I need to make a Williams key shield. And if, if you don't want to do it, I'll find somebody else, but I want to offer it to you first since you're my friend. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll do it. So I went and sourced like a FDNY style helmet on eBay. Like, I don't want to, I'm trying to get away from like anything county. Like I don't want to conflict or like, yeah. get in trouble or anything. So I'm trying to like do it the right way. And like this shirt, I'll back up a little bit only you can see it, but it's like a fire shirt, but it says Williams key on it and stuff. So. I'm gonna yes. start doing these training videos and I'll have my own um my own shield and helmet that doesn't look <laughs> anything like county. Oh, and actually this will be good too. Um there's a magazine called Crackle and I just signed a year contract with them. So they want like a full page every magazine that comes out of like Williams Key stuff. So I was like, all right, cool, I need to start like work on the image and the branding a little bit more. So he's he's making that shield for me, but what I've tried to do and I'm, I'm pushing for this is that um, the skull in the Williams key, it looks kind of like a Punisher, but it's a keyhole. And I want just that to be like recognized towards, towards my product, you know, kind of like the Nike symbol, That's awesome. like they don't have to write yes. Nike next to it, right? You just know it's Nike. So I'm trying to get away from the Williams key on everything and just put like a little keyhole skull and like, hopefully that'll uh, one day like be recognized as part of my brand. Well, it's amazing. I I love that you take the initiative and the risk to put something out there. I think one of the bad things is firemen are always like, oh, they'll judge. And who's this guy? What does he know? What's this thing? Uh, and then um, if you use it, it's a phenomenal product, right? I mean, we use it all the time. And I even think like a lot of times when I was a patient man on the squad, you roll up and you're up first on scene. You want to definitely get in there as quick as possible. And then you're waiting to try to force entry into some gate or something. And that thing just saves all the time. You don't have to wait for anybody or put your tool down. Like we had it on a little magnet on the top of the box. So you can just take it out super oh, quick. Nice. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's uh it's an amazing product. So I do, I do think you got to check them out and where can we find more about you and your products and all that kind of stuff. And we'll put links to this. Yeah. Uh, Will, Will, Williamskey.com is uh, our website. There's all the products on there, a bunch of videos. That's the best place to go to buy. But honestly, if you Google it, you won't find it on Amazon. I've tried to stay away from that. Uh, for now, I'm, I might go that route at some point, but it's doing really well uh, just through the website and all of our distributors. So if you Google it, you might find one of our distributors. If you like a different company or want to get a bunch of other stuff from Chief Miller, for example, you can get it from him too. Instagram, The Williams Key. Same with TikTok, same with YouTube. Yeah, we have a great following. If you have a Williams key and you want to send us some pictures or videos with it, we love new content. We'll try and post it. Um, so yeah, that's it. And I'm really open to like discussing tactics or if you have a door you have a question about or a lock, hit me up. The Williams key at gmail.com is a great way to get a hold of me. Or you can also try the messenger in the DMs on Instagram is one I check a lot. So I'm open to anything. Or if you even want advice about like getting on the job or something, hit me up. I love it. Well, we appreciate you coming on brother. And this has been super fun. I, what an, it's an amazing story. Your background is incredible. And I think that's one of the, the most interesting or most fun things about doing the podcast is that you and I could probably meet on a, on a day or an, on the job or something. And you would never know, you know, that kind of history. And I think this is, 
uh, what I've learned is that everybody has a story and it might not be as wild as yours, but I think, you know, as human beings on the planet, we all have stories and there's always different ways of giving back and different ways of, of, of things. And I think yours is very inspirational. So people get that out of that. Uh, but I really appreciate you coming on, brother. I can't wait to see what's next for you and the fam and Yasmin and two little girls. Very cool. Thanks for having me on the show. This has been the Fire You Carry podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Big thank you to Trevor for coming on and having that awesome conversation with Kevin. Again, follow the links in the show notes. If you do not already own a Williams key for your rig, you should probably go buy one right now. So go take care of that. Links for that are in the show notes. We do have the next Fire Up program coming up. It's going to be here pretty quick. It's going to be April 21st through the 23rd. We would love to see you out there. The snow that we got inundated with this last couple of weeks should be pretty much gone by then. But regardless of whether or not it's on the ground, we will have a great time and we would love to see you out there. So drop everything, go buy a Williams key, go sign up for the Fire Up program, and we'll see you next week. The Fire You Carry podcast is brought to you by Noel Lilly and Kevin Welsh. Intro and outro music is written and performed by My Epic and used with permission of Face Down Records.